My name is Sarah Kate, and I'm your folk music and art teacher from the Heinemann Settlement School. Well, Appalachia has always been a home to lots of folks from different backgrounds and experiences. Natives and indigenous folks, white settlers from Europe, and African Americans have been a part of Appalachia for a long, long time. And the blend of all these cultures is what makes Appalachia and Eastern Kentucky great, is what makes it special and a really interesting place to live and call home. And today, I want to share with you a little bit of the music and folk stories from the African American community in Appalachia. A lot of the traditional art and music that comes from the black community in Appalachia was created as a way to help them process their feelings of pain from being separated from their families and from their homes because of slavery. Music and art helped them get through those really horrendous times. And that's a good thing to remember because even though some, some of these songs are sad, it's important that we listen to them. It's important that we learn from them and it's important that we empathize and music can help us do that. We're gonna sing a song from the African-American tradition called Wade in the Water. And this song is really interesting because it's actually a secret code. And there's lots of songs like this in the African-American tradition that contain secret codes that were actually advice and directions on how folks in captivity in plantations on the south could escape to a safer area in the north. There are songs like Follow the Drinking Gourd and Steal Away. Those are songs that were coded messages. And this is just one of them. This is called Wade in the Water. And the advice in this song that's a secret code is the words wade in the water. What does that mean? That meant that if you were trying to, to, uh, to travel without being detected, walking through a creek bed was a good way to lose the scent in case uh, dogs were trying to sniff out where you were. And it was also a good way to disguise your footsteps. Water would wash away your footsteps. So this is a really interesting song, and I hope you'll sing it with me. Your part sounds like this. Here we go. Wait in the water. Wait in the water, children. Wait in the water. God's gonna trouble the water. Sing that with me. Wait.
was a traditional song from the African-American community. And now I want to tell you a folk story. This is an African-American story from North Carolina. And this story is about why birds are many different colors. A long time ago, birds were not brightly colored like they are today. Instead, all birds were either black or white or gray or brown, and they didn't have the pretty colors that they do today. I'm sure that you remember the story of Noah and the Ark. There were lots and lots of birds on board the Ark, and when the rain stopped, Noah sent one of these birds, a dove, out to find dry land. And after waiting a long time, the dove came back, carrying a little leaf in its mouth. The dove carrying that leaf was a sign that the floodwaters had gone away and it was safe to leave the ark. But the ground was still muddy and the air was still misty and clouds covered the surface of the earth. God saw how muddy it was on earth, so God shoved all the clouds over to the edge of the world so the sun could beam down and dry out the earth. The sun shining through the mist created a magical sight. Suddenly the mist began to sparkle and glow in bright colors. Red, orange, yellow, blue, and violet shone through the mist. This was God's first rainbow. When Noah opened the great big doors of the ark and let everybody out, the birds flew out with a great swish of wings and chittering and chattering. They flew right into the rainbow and through it and back again. The ones who flew into the blue color came out blue. The ones into the red came out red. And some of them were so happy that they flew around and wallowed into all the colors. And today those birds have every color of the rainbow in their feathers. The banjo is such a special part of Appalachian music and bluegrass music, but did you know that we would not even have the banjo if it wasn't for all of these African ancestors to the banjo? I want to take you on a tour of the ancestors to the banjo and show you how it evolved over time. So we think that the banjo started out as an instrument similar to this. This is called a mouth bow or a song bow. And it's just a stick and a string. And these instruments are found all over the world, including Africa. They're found in South America and in Asia um, as well. And the, the musician, in order to play this, you would put it up against your cheek to create a resonant chamber. And it sounds like this. I think that sounds really cool. Now folks realized that if they attached a gourd, you would get a bigger and a different sound. And you'd also use a stick. I'm just using a pencil right now, but it sounds like this. This is called the birim bow, uh, the rhythm bow. And you can even bounce it up against your knee. To make a different sound. That's the birim bow. Now over time, an instrument like this was, uh, was created and this is called the akonting and it's an African instrument from the country of Gambia. And notice it's looking more and more like a banjo, isn't it? So notice that it has a couple strings, three to be exact, and it has a fretboard where a musician will put their fingers to change the sound. And the akonting is played with a similar style as claw hammer banjo, which is still played today in Appalachia. So after a while, an instrument 
like this was being built. And after, after folks from Africa were, uh, were, were brought here um, as part of the slave trade, they brought the memories of these instruments, and they started building instruments that, that were similar to these, but, but a little bit different, because they just used what they had available. And, and the instrument evolved even further into this instrument, which is called the gourd banjo. It's looking even more like a banjo. It has a, it has a wider fretboard, more room for your fingers, it has more strings, but notice it's still made out of a gourd and it still has an animal hide. It sounds like this. So after the gourd banjo, as the banjo um, was adopted and, and began to be played by, by white folks in, in, in America, it evolved even further into, uh, into an instrument that had metal clamps around the edges and, uh, and, and, uh, and it didn't use uh, animal skin anymore. Now people use like a, a, a plastic material. But now, I don't play the banjo super well, but my friend Kaya does, and she's a claw hammer banjo player, and she's our special guest for today's video, and she's going to tell you more about the banjo. Hi, everybody. My name is Kaya, and I heard that you've been learning a lot about the African-American roots of the banjo. So here's my banjo, and you can see the bottom part looks a lot like a drum, right? looks a lot like a snare drum and it sounds a lot like a snare drum and here are the, these metal clamps that go all the way around the head of the banjo but you know just like you and I have parents and grandparents and ancestors the banjo is no different and the ancestors of the banjo come all the way from West Africa places like Mali and East Africa, places like Tanzania. And just like you and I have cousins, the banjo also has cousins. Um, the akonting, the kora, those are West African instruments that look and sound a lot like the banjo that we know over here, but they're just the ancestors of it. And so um, they have gourd bottoms. And I know you know that word gourd, from follow the drinking gourd and their necks this part are wooden and sometimes they have more strings or less strings and it's all part of the same family except this banjo came over on the transatlantic slave trade um, when when black people were enslaved in America so I've been playing the banjo ever since I was in fifth grade I was just a little bit older than you when I started learning and I love it. I love to play, but I also love to sing, and I heard that you do too. So what I thought we could do is sing a song called Freight Train together. And Freight Train was written by a folk and blues musician named Elizabeth Cotton. And uh, she was born in Carborough, North Carolina. And she wrote this song, Freight Train, because she was a teenager in Carborough and she would hear the train pass very near her house and, and she thought that it was really musical and poetic. And uh, I'm gonna teach you the lyrics if you feel like singing along. The lyrics go, freight train, freight train runs so fast, freight train, freight train runs so fast. Please don't tell what train I'm on they won't know where I'm going. All right, so without further ado, here is Elizabeth Cotton's Freight Train. Freight train, freight train, run so fast. Freight train, freight. 
train runs so fast Please don't tell what train I'm on They won't know where I'm going When I'm dead and in my grave No more good times here I crave Place some stones at my head and feet Tell them I've gone to sleep Freight train, freight train runs so fast Sing with me Freight train, freight train runs so fast Please don't tell what train I'm on You won't know where I'm going Last time, sing with me. Freight train, freight train runs so fast. Freight train, freight train runs so fast. Please don't tell what train I'm on. You won't know where I'm going. Please don't tell what train I'm on. They won't know. Have a great day, everybody. I'm Kaya. Take care. Our artist for this week's lesson is Miss Lakeisha Blunt, and she's from North Carolina. And she created these absolutely beautiful paint-by-number coloring pages. You're going to need three colors, a dark purple, a light purple, and a pink. And there's two different versions. There's a simple version like this one. That's for the little ones. And for that, you just need two colors, a light purple and a pink. Or the other one below it, that's a little more complex version for the older kids. So I hope you really enjoy these. Well, I hope you enjoyed listening to the music and stories from the African American community in Appalachia. And I want you to sing along with me with our last song today. This song is called There's a Bright Side Somewhere. And it was sung by a, by a gentleman by the name of Reverend Gary Davis. He was a preacher and a musician and a blues singer. And this song is a good reminder that even while we're in the middle of hard times, things will get better. That's a good reminder for us right now. Um, and I want you to help me sing it. I'm going to teach you the chorus. I want you to sing along real loud at home. And I also want you to help me write your own verse. You're going to write your own verse to this song. So you're going to need to think of what's one thing that always makes me feel better after a hard day, if you've had a bad day? What's something that makes you feel better? My verse is gonna be about hugs, because hugs always make me feel better after a bad day. So thank you for hanging out with me. I'll see you next week. There's a bright side somewhere. There's a bright
here's my verse that I wrote. There is more hugs somewhere. There is more hugs somewhere. Ain't gonna rest none until I find it. There is more hugs somewhere. There's a bright side. Thank you for singing with me, and I'll see you next time. Bye.